Mendel also was able to identify this law of independent assortment, meaning that chromosomes sort themselves independent of one another. So he was able to derive the law of segregation by following a single character. The F1 offspring, in this case, were monohybrids. So individuals that were heterozygous were only one character. That's where the mono comes from. Hybrid comes from being heterozygous. So a cross between two heterozygotes is called a monohybrid cross. So what Mendel did was he identified a second law of inheritance by following two characters at the same time, which would be a dihybrid cross. So he took two true breeding parents that differed in two characters, and they produced dihybrids in the F1 generation. They were heterozygous for both characters. Then he took, um, he did what he called a dihybrid cross using a Punnett square. So he took those two F1 dihybrids to determine whether two characters are transmitted to offspring together as a package or whether they actually um, were transmitted independently of each other. So here's what he found out. He took this seed, which is round and yellow, and he crossed it with this seed, which is green and wrinkled. And here's what he found. If you just look at, um, if you look at the cross, you'll see there's a phenotypic ratio of 3 to 1 here. So if we're looking at just the phenotype or the physical appearance, we get a 3 to 1 ratio of these yellow round seeds. Um, when we this is what would be true if we thought that these were sorted together. So if you look here, you can see that if you thought this Y was attached to this R and this Y was attached to this R, this is what you would get. However, if these genes sorted independently or if these alleles sorted independently, then you get what you see over here on the right-hand side, which gives you a phenotypic ratio of 9 to 3 to 3 to 1. Okay, so 9 uh, nine yellow round, three green round, three yellow wrinkled, and one green wrinkled. So you can see that here. So using this dihybrid cross, Mendel developed the law of independent assortment. The law of independent assortment tells us that each pair of alleles segregates independently of each other pair of alleles during gamete formation. So this applies only to genes that are on different non-homologous chromosomes or if they are very far apart on the same chromosome because genes that are located near each other on a chromosome, they tend to be inherited together. So we can use the laws of probability to govern Mendelian inheritance or to predict Mendelian inheritance. So his laws of segregation and independent assortment reflect the rules of probability. So, for example, when you toss a coin, the outcome of one toss has no income, no income. Well, it also has no income. But what I'm trying to say is it has no impact on the outcome of the next toss. So every single time you toss a coin, it's an independent event. So in the same way, the alleles of one gene segregate into gametes, and it's independent of another gene's alleles, and it, it acts differently every single time. So the multiplication rule tells us that the probability of two or more independent events occurring together is the product of their individual probabilities. So the probability in an F1 monohybrid cross can be determined using the multiplication rule. So it's just like flipping a coin. So each gamete has a half a chance of carrying the dominant allele and a half a chance of carrying the recessive allele if you're talking about a monohybrid. So remember, that's a heterozygote. So if each offspring has a half a chance, you can see how this plays out here in the math. One half times one half gives you a quarter. So there is a quarter chance that this would happen, a one in four chance that this combination would happen, a one in four chance that this one would happen, and a one in four chance that this one would happen. The addition rule tells us the probability that any one of two or more exclusive events will occur as calculated by adding together their individual probabilities. So, for example, this rule can be used to figure out 
the probability that an F2 plant from a monohybrid cross will be heterozygous rather than homozygous. So if you look closely, um, if you remember way back from your probability days, if they occur together, it means and. So if, if you're looking for something and something else, you'll multiply. But if you want two independently exclusive events possibly to occur together, like this one or this one, see the or, you will use the addition rule. So we can use probability to solve complex genetic problems. It's not always practical to draw a Punnett square. So we can apply these rules to predict the outcome of crosses involving multiple characters. So a dihybrid or other multi-character cross is equivalent to two or more independent monohybrid crosses occurring simultaneously. So what this means is you could do monohybrid crosses for each trait or you could just calculate the chances for the various genotypes um, using each character considered separately and then the individual probabilities would be multiplied. So if we go back to our yellow round seed, there is a 1 in 4 probability of getting capital Y, capital Y, 1 half times 1 half. Um, and there is a 1 in 4 possibility of getting capital R, capital R, which is 1 half or 1 half. Um, and so if you multiply 1 quarter by 1 quarter, you get 1 16th. The probability of getting capital Y lowercase y is 1 half, and the probability of getting capital R capital R remains 1 quarter. So in this case, the probability of getting capital Y lowercase y capital R capital R is going to give us a probability of 1 eighth. And you can do this to determine all of these traits. So just take a moment to look at this. Inheritance patterns are often more complex than Mendel had originally thought. So, for example, the relationship between the genotype and the phenotype um, can be influenced by other factors, not just these inheritable characters. Some characters are determined by one gene with two alleles, but some are determined by either multiple alleles or possibly multiple chromosomes, and no matter how we look at it, these basic, princi basic principles of segregation and independent assortment still apply. Okay, so for a single gene, uh, there may be some deviation from Mendel's initial patterns that he recognized. If, for example, the alleles are not completely dominant or completely recessive, they will deviate from, his sim from Mendel's simple patterns if a gene has more than two alleles or if a gene is going to produce multiple phenotypes. So we've got complete dominance. That's when the phenotypes of the heterozygote and the dominant zygote are identical. So that's what we've referred to as dominance in the past or the dominant recessive pattern of inheritance. Incomplete dominance is where the phenotype of the F1 hybrids is somewhere between the phenotypes of the two parental varieties. So this is, for example, if you took a red flower and a white flower and you um, and they made it and you got a pink flower. So it's somewhere between. It's intermediate. It's incomplete. It's, it's a mix of the two phenotypes. In codominance, you have two dominant alleles that affect the phenotype in two separate distinguishable ways. So both traits will be present. And the example here would be um, in roan cattle, for example. You take the red ca red cattle and the white cattle and you get, no, is that right? Hmm. Complete dominance is what we have referred to in the past as the uh, dominant recessive pattern of inheritance. So if a trait is considered to be a dominant trait and the dominant allele if the allele for the dominant trait is present, then that will always show in the phenotype. 
Incomplete dominance is when you get a mix of the two alleles. So for example, if you take a red flower and a white flower and their offspring produces a pink flower, you now have an intermediate or an incomplete dominance inheritance pattern. In codominance, you have two alleles that they're both dominant and therefore they both show in the phenotype. And one of the examples we used in living environment was the, um, the chickens. If you had a, a black rooster, for example, and a white hen, the offspring might have black and white feathers. So here is an example. This one yields pink flowers. Pink is in between red and white. So if you look back, that would be the incomplete dominance that we were talking about. So this would be an example of incomplete dominance. There is also a relationship between dominance and phenotype. So a dominant allele, it's not stronger than a recessive allele. It doesn't subdue a recessive allele. Uh, it's simply a variation in the nucleotide sequence. And for any character, the dominance or the recessiveness relationships of the alleles is going to depend on the level at which we examine the phenotype. So it will depend on how closely we are actually looking at the phenotype. So for example, we've got Tay-Sachs disease. That's a fatal, um, a f fatal disease caused by a dysfunctional enzyme which has lipids that accumulate th in the brain. So on the organismal level, the allele is recessive. But at the biochemical level, uh, the phenotype is completely dominant. And at the molecular level, the alleles are co-dominant. Dominant alleles are not necessarily the most common. Um, so, for example, polydactyly is a, is a dominant allele, which means having multiple extra fingers or toes. One baby out of 400 in the United States is born with extra fingers or toes, but the allele for polydactyly is dominant to the allele for five digits per appendage. There are many situations in which multiple alleles govern a phenotype. So, for example, our ABO blood type is determined by three alleles for an enzyme that attach to either A or B carbohydrates, that attach either A or B carbohydrates to red blood cells. So, the enzyme here, IA, codes for the A carbohydrate, and IB codes for the B carbohydrate. And the, the lowercase or the recessive I allele adds neither, and that is our O blood type. So this is how blood typing pans out. Um, as you can see, there are different genotypes here. The appearance of the red blood cell is going to be different, and this is going to result in a different phenotype. So in this case, the physical appearance relates back to the, to the appearance of the cells. So you should study this and think about it and know this form of multiple inheritance. Pleiotropy is a situation where there are multiple phenotypic effects. So, for example, um, cystic fibrosis and sickle cell disease are, called by, are caused by pleiotropy, where genes have multiple effects, not just one. And then some traits are inherited by two or more genes, uh, which we would call polygenic inheritance, so poly more than one, genic, genetic genes, or genic refers to genes and inheritance. So there are quantitative characters that vary in a population along a continu continuum, for example, and the variation indicates polygenic inheritance, and there's an additive effect. So for example, if there were um, 10 alleles and all of those alleles code for melatonin, which is a pigment that gives skin its color. The more you have, the darker your skin will be, and the fewer you have, the lighter your skin will be. So here is an example. And then, of course, the environment can also have an impact on phenotype. So the norm of the reaction is the phenotypic range that's influenced by the environment. So hydrangeas have a range that it go from blue-violet to pink, and it depends on the acidity of the soil. There are also um, different types of reptiles whose gender is determined, or whose sex, technically, is determined by the temperature at which the eggs develop. The norms of reaction are generally the broadest for polygenic characters or, um, or traits that are inherited by multiple genes.